In 16 days, a ministerial task force on illegal mining is expected to go hard on Galamsey operations in Ghana. Last week, the Lands and Natural Resources Minister issued a three-week ultimatum to illegal miners to halt their activities as government steps up the fight against the illegal activity. John Peter Mehu warns that all illegal miners who fail to stop the activities should be prepared to face the full rigors of the law. Matilda Romega has more. Illegal mining has been a major national development challenge successive governments have grappled with over the years. Apart from depriving the country of its agricultural land, the practice has resulted in the pollution of major water bodies. In some cases, the illegal miners, mostly Chinese nationals, in connivance with Ghanaians, have had violent confrontations with residents of communities where the practice is rife, leading to loss of lives and destruction of properties. Some traditional rulers and opinion leaders have been linked to the practice because they appear to be providing space for the illegal miners to operate. Thatching on the involvement of local influences in the menace, the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, John Peter Meu, said anyone found behind illegal mining activities won't face the full rigors of the law. Uh, we seek to do this because what is happening now is that uh, there have been some Chinese and foreigners in the system that tends to provide what they call you know, mining services. Under the law, the small scale, we do not have to provide mining services to the small scale. And that is why we are seeing the introductions of heavy moving, F moving equipment, D6, D8, you know, to the small scale. So within the ministry, these are some of the things that we uh, are putting down on, on, on a paper and we're looking for uh, cabinet approval to, you know, implement this, which is going to be a more sustainable in the long way, uh, in the long term approach to address some of this problem. What is happening now, the pollution of the water bodies, mining in the cocoa farms and other areas is total lawlessness. It has nothing to do with the livelihood of the people. It's lawlessness. The law says do not go and mine in the water bodies. And people are going to mine in the water bodies. Why do you say that we need to consider those people because of the purpose of livelihood? Those guys are killing you. So for the lawlessness, for the purpose of lawlessness, the law enforcement agencies would have to, you know, apply the law to make sure that those culprits that are responsible for these activities are, are dealt with. Some government officials have already warned of a total system collapse if government goes ahead to ban the activities of illegal miners. One of them is Member of Parliament for Upper Densha West. In Suwajan says, Galamse has become the main source of livelihood for his people and any attempt to flush them out without the provision of an alternative source of livelihood will lead to serious economic rift and an escalation of social vices among the residents. The minister proposes an alternative livelihood support program for the many youth engaged in the practice who will soon be out of jobs. Other alternative livelihood that can generate from this activity is going to include planting, you know, and reclamation of the area. If we reclaim the area, we're going to provide a lot of job opportunities. Planting of trees can also create job opportunities. There are several small scale miners today in this country. If you visit their mines, you'll be surprised. They are doing it correctly, you know, in accordance with the terms and the regulations of the law. Their sites are very clean. We don't have any problem against those people who are going by the law. Those that refuse and those that do not even have permit, but on, own, on their own are doing this, these are the people that we are asking that they should stop. Meanwhile, the five-member tax force committee headed by President Deku Fuado is expected to launch a national policy in some few days. Matilda Pomagam for Joy News, Accra. Well, former Environment, Lands and Natural Resources Minister Alaji Nusa Fusini has revealed there were attempts by Chinese delegation to bribe him with a scholarship for his son. This was to stop him from clamping down Chinese nationals engaged in illegal small scale mining. The minister says he turned down the offer with a warning to go after illegal miners ruthlessly. I think that they shouldn't over concentrate on funding, cutting the funding source. The, there are many sources of funding sources. I mean, many funding sources coming to the small scale mining sector. It's not only from China, even Dubai. I mean, most of the gold that they sell in Dubai comes from Ghana. Ghana. And okay. so we know that there are many sources of funding. The, the Ghanaians within Ghana fund small scale mining sector. Okay. So when I was there, I didn't attempt to cut the source. source. 
I said that the first attempt was to use law, law and order because if someone is defecating around your door, you don't beg that fellow to collect the feces. You compel that fellow to do that. Okay. And so let's compel them to leave the small scale mining sector. You see, a ruthless enforcement of the law. He said that that posture no, has not worked. First over of the all, years. sends a signal. If you want people to obey the law, the law must be enforced ruthlessly. Okay. That promotes the efficacy of the law. I see. And two, so the first attempt was to use law and order. I agree. Stakeholders. No land in this country is barren, is free. All land have got owners. So they should engage? The owners of the land, the chiefs. I, 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 you, I've always said that in doing the small scale mining, one day I went to a cabinet meeting. And in explaining the difficulty, I, I told the president that I didn't think my ministry ought to exist. <laughs> because all natural resources of the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources are found within the districts. The Gufuadu administration is set to roll out a five-year national policy aimed at halting the illegal business by monitoring the illegal activities with drones and reducing funding to Galante operators from source. Reacting to that plan, the force would give to Andrew Apiano Sofuseni he said the real problem is centralization of such plans and lack of law enforcement, advising President Kufado to make the fight against Galamse a key performance indicator for district chief executives. Uh, pressure Group Occupy Ghana is asking government to, as a matter of urgency, put measures in place to end the Galamse minutes. The act has resulted in Ghana's water bodies deteriorating, making them unwholesome. Member of the group Nana Safong Ejman Bedu tells joining us Derek Ekosam. The group also warns Ghanaians to wear red to show how serious they are about their resolve to force government to end the deadly menace. Some of us visited the Galamse sites last year. I went there personally myself to engage some of the people, even some of the Galamse campaigns there. And it's be surprising the amount of money they make. So we are prepared, based on all these things, we are preparing a report. We would also do some uh, media interactions, uh, get some a, a coalition of other media houses also and other CSOs to come on board. And then we join hands to fight this together because we cannot be doing this in isolated that, oh, this is for me, this is for us. But if we all come together and join in the fight, I think we should make a headway. Okay, and you say that you'd want workers uh, and, and, and those who are not members of Occupy Ghana to also wear red on Fridays. I mean, w just wearing red might not send the message. It might not, but it's, it's, it's symbolic. It's not like necessarily wearing red shirt, but anything red. That's usually how we uh, activate our you know, um, campaigns, through the Red Friday activation. So once you wear red, it shows that um, you are actually in support of this fight against Galamsi. We're moving to the upper west region where scores of residents of Wa, mostly the youth, Monday afternoon hit the streets to demonstrate against the Ghana Police Service for the alleged shooting of a 23-year-old teacher. Ali Rashid was allegedly shot by Constable Francis Penge for riding an unregistered motorbike. The incident resulted in the breakdown of law and order in the Wa municipality as the aggrieved youth pelted stones, blocked major roads and burned lorry ties. Despite appeals and assurances from the Interior Minister Ambrose Derry to the residents to remain calm whilst they investigate the issue, the youth hit the streets again Monday afternoon to demand justice for the victim. Rafiq Salam reports from Wa. The demonstration started like a storm in a teacup at the Tindamba Junior High School Park with a dozen of young men who decided to walk through some principal streets in the Wat Township before presenting their grievances to the Upper West Regional Minister, Suleiman Al-Hassan. It was about the alleged shooting of a 23-year-old teacher, Ali Rashid, by a police constable last Saturday. The incident angered some youth in the Wai municipality and they pelted stones at the police, blocked some major roads in the town and bent lorry ties on the middle of the road. One police corporal, James Kumfa, was severely wounded by the mob. Few minutes after they hit the streets, they were joined by a slew of people who shared similar concern. They chanted, no police, no shooting, as they went through all major streets in the war township, unaided by the police or any security personnel. 
They were prevented from entering the forecourt of the Upper West Regional Coordinating Council by three dozens of policemen. There was a tangle between the demonstrators and the police who were at the gate as they tried to overpower them. The timely arrival of soldiers from the Tamala Airborne Force Detachment Base in Wa saved the situation as they chased the angry demonstrators away. They responded by throwing stones at the soldiers who were visible angered but managed to control their temper. It took their leaders a hell of time to speak to them to calm down. Upper West Regional Minister Suleiman Alassan appealed to them to exercise restraint as they have already started investigation on the case. What happened Saturday night was an unfortunate incident. Oh, so unfortunate. And please, we want to say that nobody is happy about it. Yes. yes. We are all sad about the whole thing. We want to assure you that you are our people. We are here because of you. And what happened on Saturday, if that man, gentleman had lost his life, it would have gone against all of us. So this is not the first time. Okay, we are going to make sure that it will not repeat itself again. We want you to be patient. Try and exercise some restraint. Realistically, we are handling the matter. We had a regional security council meeting yesterday on the issue, and we are taking measures. The matter is being investigated, and I assure you that the proper thing will be done. Thank you very much. Anybody found guilty will suffer for it. Leader of the demonstrators, Yusuf Juno, thanked the regional minister for giving them the audience. It's high time yeah. the police respected the people of this town. Okay. We have tolerated them enough. Upper West is one of the peaceful regions in this country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No thought about that. Yeah. We have respected the police enough. Yeah. You've never heard, you've never heard that, we've, that, we've, that people have done something to the police. Okay. Therefore, we want the police to also respect us. Okay. Don't treat us like criminals. We are not criminals. We are people. Okay. And we deserve our rights yeah. in this region. That's all. Yeah. Meanwhile, Deputy Upper West Regional Police Commander of the Ghana Police Service ACP Edward Udro Quarton revealed that they have arrested and kept in their custody Constable Francis Pengi, who is alleged to have shot 23 year old teacher. As I'm talking, he's in police cells and we are going to investigate further. We will let you know the outcome of the investigation. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he has committed a crime, so we are going to investigate him. As for crime, we don't know the difference between a civilian and a policeman. Every crime is a crime. So, when are you taking him to the local court? As soon as the investigation is completed. Reporting for J News, Rafik Salam. Wow. And you're watching J News Prime still to come in the bulletin. Speaker of Parliament yet to pronounce some parliamentary bribery scandal following the apology of the Boku Central MP Mama Yariga. But a member of the five member committee which investigated the bribery claim is urging everyone else to remain calm. We'll bring you all that and more when we return from the break session. The Public Utilities Workers Union pool is urging the Kufado led government to critically look at the Millennium Challenge Corporation compact between Ghana and the United States, stressing that the MPP government's one district, one factory policy could suffer some consequences should government give out ETG on concession as recommended in the power compact pool at a meeting of the senior staff union of ecg division of the public utility workers union at Ho in the volta region is proposing the listing of ecg on the stock market after the five-year contract period of the mcc compact expires by which time it believes its challenges would have been resolved fred kwame Asari's report he emphasized that arrangements aligned in the concession will only benefit the private investor and increase the woes of Ghanaians where power tariffs will be increased since the private investor will be interested in making profits. Mr. Idumata was optimistic ECG will witness significant transformation and be more efficient in its service delivery if government gives ECG the same support it provides. 
Yes, there are challenges ECG is facing. Nobody can run away from it. And we are of the view that government should put in place a firm, strong leader, give the leader specific terms of reference or key performance indicators, and allow the leader within agreed time frame to work and let's see. Currently, there are projects which are ongoing. There are a number of interventions ECG on its own have commenced to bring about relevant transformation to improve revenue collection and to reduce the losses. A lot of these interventions are rolling yet to see friction. And like in the middle of a game, you are just stopping and saying that the private operator should come and take over when many of these problems are almost being addressed. So that at the end of the day, the private operator will come and take ECG in a more uh, refurbished form. And then we begin to see uh, changes or results. And we think that it is the doing of the private uh, operator, which we think is not fair. The private operator under the concession arrangement. He asserted that ECG being bedeviled with challenges was as a result of government owing the electricity distributing company huge debt and charged the government to pay its debt to enable the power distribution company operate efficiently. What we are saying is that there are other alternatives to even bring in private sector participation, but not necessarily with this kind of concession arrangement. So, so it's not the issue of uh, even the duration or the time of the concession. We have proposed and we have seen this working in Ghana, the stock exchange option, which government itself recently said is going to list uh, VRA and Greco. We have said that this is one option we can use. We should use the five-year period of the MCC compact to prepare ECG and list it on the stock exchange. Ghana Commercial Bank is working well. It's still a, a state-owned company. They are doing well currently in the uh, energy sector, the uh, petroleum marketing companies. Well, is the market leader in Ghana. It's still state-owned. So if these options are working, why can't we explore these alternatives? Fred Kwame Asari's report for Joy News. The minority in parliament is daring government to go to court over the AmeriPAR deal if it is convinced the deal was fraudulent. It says the deal provided the country with the cheapest thermal power in the country and was not overpriced. The report of a committee set up to investigate the deal is recommending a review and possible abrogation on the basis of fraud. Former Energy Minister and MP for Pru, Dr. Kwabna Donko, at a news conference insisted the deal went through all the necessary audits before it was signed. The government entered into a contract with Ameri Energy as a developer. The developer carries all the risk of the project. And whoever, whoever the developer brings as an EPC contractor or subcontractor is of no consequence except where the contract states that the client must approve the subcontractor, which is not the case in this built own operate and transfer agreement. The financial arrangement between a developer and or EPC contractor is the private business of the consortium. This principle is well established in energy project management. What is expected of government is to achieve a good tariff for the consumer. In this particular case, the tariff for Ameri levelized at 11.46 cents per kilowatt hour is currently the cheapest thermal plant in Ghana in terms of tariff. The committee claimed it had not cited any document replacing APR with Ameri Energy. That is paragraph 7E of the report. There is no such document because Ameri never replaced APR. Ameri initially indicated they were bringing APR when the rental option was under discussion. 
However, when we moved to the BOT, APR indicated unofficially that they would want to bring some slightly used turbines from Libya. The government team completely rejected any idea of used equipment. The report claimed in page 7E that due diligence was not done. In an emergency situation, the ministry was happy to leave due diligence to J.P. Morgan, the international financial giant that confirmed the standby letter of credit. J.P. Morgan only agreed to confirm the standby letter of credit after their own due diligence. Parliament also proved the credentials of Ameri and requested and received the appropriate documentation before approving the power purchase agreement. And it is important to know that the state of Ghana had no exposure to Ameri at this stage because the risk of procuring the turbines was on Ameri and not Ghana. The minority alleged at the news conference that the company being investigated paid for the committee members to travel to Turkey to conduct the investigations and wondered how such a committee would produce an objective report. MP for Sade, lawyer Rock Singh, that film of course says the review, review by government is only meant to gain political capital. Two key members of this of the, of the supposed committee, uh, Mr. Addison and, and, and Ms. Vicky Bright, are all... I regard them as experienced legal practitioners. And if they will read the contract advert again, they will know that establishing fraud is a basis of repudiating the contract. So if they think that by the work of their committee they have established fraud, this is not a forum to, to, to vent their, their complaint. They should go to the court and say that because we have found fraud in the deal, we are asking the court to terminate the contract and let's interrogate that matter. They know they cannot do it. So this is what they are doing. It's a political agenda. If you recall, they said that they are going to review all the power sector contracts, about 42 of them. And so this is the beginning. And we are waiting for them. So we want to, so from the legal perspectives, you don't, you don't set up a committee and supposedly establish fraud and invite the, the other party to the contract back to the negotiating table. It is not done like that. So if you establish fraud and, and, and you think that the other person has unilaterally, not mutually, but unilaterally introduced fraud into the negotiation prior to executing the contract, you go to court and have it terminated. This is, not, this is forum non-convenience. They should go to the court and we'll meet them there. Former Energy Minister Dr. Kwame Adonko further questioned why one Aaron Hughes, who former Deputy Attorney General Dr. Dominic Ayene has sued for false publication of the Mary deal, was appointed as a member of the review committee. Members of the Addison Committee, including Mr. Addison himself, visited Dubai. They had meetings with Mary, even after this report was written. We want to ask, who paid for their tickets? Who paid for the hotel accommodation that they used? We have the evidence that Ameri Energy paid for their hotel. Ameri Energy paid for their flights, their tickets. If we are going to investigate someone, <laughs> Do they pay for your tickets and pay for your accommodation and host you? And host you? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are in a country of law. Our side will not want to see an energy sector divided between NDC and MPP. Well, the IMF has been speaking to the government's decision to review the energy sector agreement.
We are part of that uh, consultation process. We do participate. So let me not preempt what the IMF mission will come up with, but there is goodwill on both sides, as far as I'm aware, on the side of the government, on the side of the IMF, to reach some understanding on how to proceed with the IMF program. If I engage the interest in the bonds, what are these institutional investors telling you? Uh, Frank and Templeton, are you going to expect some announcement from them as well? What is driving the sudden interest in the goodwill on your part, donors, as well as these investors in the economy? Overall, it's always confidence in the management of the economy. And I think the way that the CD has appreciated in the couple, last uh, couple of weeks or so, uh, the way that we forecast there will be macroeconomic stability coming back to Ghana, Watching Joy News Prime, we're taking a break. We'll bring you business news now. Now, leadership of Parliament is urging calm as the House anxiously awaits the Speaker's ruling on the Joe Gatti Committee's report on investigated allegations of bribery against members of the Appointments Committee. Professor Michael Quay assured on Thursday night he will rule on what form of reprimand should be meted out to Boku Central MP Mama Yariga after he was found guilty of contempt for failing to substantiate his allegations of bribery. The House is sitting late into the night to deliberate on a number of issues and Deputy Majority Chief Whip and MP for Pandai Matthew Yendam tells Joy News the Speaker may just pronounce on the matter. But it's still in session. Okay, the speaker is still around. We, we just suspended the house. We'll be going in. But one thing we must all know is that it is not left with only the speaker to come out with his ruling. And you cannot go and ask the speaker, when are you bringing your ruling? It really doesn't sound right. Okay, he's in charge. If he decides today I'm going to give the ruling, he gives. If he decides within the week, which we still have up to, Friday, per the business statement, we are supposed to be up to Friday. Because that's the other bit of it, that we know that the house is rising sometime soon, and I wish I would really be able to, you know, deal with this issue as in the ruling come out, and if someone wants to challenge it, get it challenged before the house eventually rises? Oh, sure, but we don't need to deal with the issues within this session, no. If the speaker, speaker gives a ruling and you think that you want you want to, to challenge the ruling, you write a time will be given up to you, we are coming back again. Even if you want, it's going to be as you can recall parliament. If it's it need be. <laughs> speaker can recall parliament for us to come and deal with it. But if it's not so urgent, we'll put it down. When we resume, we'll deal with it. At the, at, at the level of leadership, both on the majority and the minority side, what kind of Input are you making into the speaker's ruling? What advice are you offering? Oh, we think that, we think that personally, if you ask my personal opinion, what happened was seriously an unfortunate incident. That Thursday, what some of us saw and what we witnessed, I as a young man wouldn't encourage anybody. There have been some kind of attempts to see how we can all cool, cool heads and see how the speaker also come down. Because I actually have to say that I'm, I'm pleased with the speaker that day. Because if you look at the, the, the emotions and the tension that day, if he had come out with some kind of ruling, we don't know what would have happened. So it's good he decided in his own wisdom, as mature as he was, decided that, look, I'm suspending or I'm, I'm, I'm adjoining the house and I'll come out with my ruling. And I think that it is in the wisdom of the speaker and the leadership. Everybody is working towards it. And that's what we are waiting for. Because I was spoken to MPs who are equally concerned that this is taking too much time, it's dominating too much attention. It's about time we got it over and done with and moved on. What do you say to MPs like that? Oh, they should calm down. You see, we are all human, okay? And I can tell you that 70%, 80% of MPs are not pleased with what is going on. I agree with them, okay? And I think that sometimes it's also good, okay? Sometimes it's good that sometimes tempers can calm down, okay? When speaker comes up finally with his ruling, we must all see how we agree with it and then move this house forward. But my joy is that at the end of the day, hmm, the report is not being, no one is discrediting the report. No. No one is actually attacking the report that somebody was not given the opportunity to talk, somebody was not given the opportunity to present some kind of evidence. No, those things are not coming up. Okay? And this particular committee did not go to sit down in somebody's room. It was live, it was everywhere. Well, we're going to Parliament now, where Parliamentary Correspondent Joseph Pokugako is standing by. Hello, Joseph. 
Hello, Joseph. It appears that Joseph has a difficulty hearing me. Hello, Joseph. Can you hear me? All right. Uh, we'll have to bring, uh, try and get Joseph a lot later. But moving on to other stories, a police officer who was sacked for an alleged involvement in the cocaine turn baking soda saga in 2011, DSP Gifty Mawenyega Tehoda, has opened up about how the saga almost ruined her family. The former deputy commander in charge of the Commercial Crimes Unit of the Police Service said her children were called names in school to the extent she felt giving up the fight to clear her name was more important. What I went through cannot compensate what I have been asked to take, you know, because anything could have happened. Uh, my life, I could have lost my life or that would have affected me mentally. I could have been in the psychiatric hospital now as it happened. People have committed suicide you know, because they couldn't stand what they were facing, you know. And so uh, nothing can compensate what I went through. My credibility, my image was tarnished. My, my kids, you know, were the stigma. Were called, my daughter, who was in P6 at the time, was called Cool Girl. The boy, that is Awedam, Bishop Bowers. The boy was in Adisada College, Eustace. Mm. Uh, the Hoda was called Tagor. And you know, this Tagore man was linked to a cocaine. Saga. You know, it's Saga. Up to now, he's known as Tagore. You know, and to me, myself, I will not talk about mine, you know, the cocaine woman. They call, uh, you know, uh, my daughter names in school as young as she was. So she will come home and break down in tears. That look, oh, my friends are calling me cocaine girl, for short, cook girl. And, you know, she went to report to the teacher. The teacher said she didn't mind them. But, Mommy, why, 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 why should I be going, you know? And, you know, she's young, so she's not understanding anything. Mm. The SP Tahoda also revealed that some faceless people within the police service were behind the attempt to tarnish her image. The BNI was asked to investigate. They were the first people, you know, who invited me. I appeared before them. And then uh, they did their investigations. I was uh, arraigned before courts. And there was, the trial began. And at the end of the day, you know, the recommendation was that uh, they, they found nothing criminal about me. And so I should be discharged. Mm -hmm. So having somebody, having, been, uh, uh, having accused somebody of a wrongdoing, and the same people who then said no, we have found another leg to the issue means that somebody else was responsible. responsible that was how come that statement mm. so if somebody else was responsible why don't you take your time you know and dig through all this but only for me to go through what i went through Ghanaians who want to know the truth i personally i am interested to know the truth of this matter because I am happy I have been exonerated, mm -hmm. but then that doesn't mean that whoever is involved should be left off the hook. An Accra High Court on Friday ordered the hierarchy of the Ghana Police Service to reinstate DSP Gifty Tehoda and pay her accumulated five years' salary. The court presided over by Justice Gifty J. Adu ruled that her dismissal in 2012 was wrong. DSP Tehoda will also be receiving damages of 23,000 Ghana CEDs. We're taking a break. We'll bring you international news director. South Africa's credit rating has been cut to junk status by the ratings agency S&P Global. The agency said that political upheaval, including the recent sacking of Finance Minister Pravin Gordhan, uh, was endangering the economy. S&P also expressed concern over government debt and, in particular, the expense of supporting the state energy firm ESCOM. The news put more pressure on the rand, which was down 2% against the dollar. The sacking of Mr. Gordon, seen as a safe pair of hands and with a reputation for financial prudence, led to a 4% fall in the run on Friday and prompted strong criticism. His replacement as finance minister by Malusi Gigaba was part of a cabinet reshuffle by President Jacob Zuma. Ten people have been killed in an explosion between two underground stations in St. Petersburg. 
that of Russia's National Anti-Terrorist Committee said the blast hit a train between Senyanya Plochat and Cheklovsky Institute stations. The committee said an explosive device was later found and made safe at another station nearby. Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev said in a Facebook post that the explosion was a terrorist attack. An anti-terror investigation has been opened, but other possible causes are being investigated. Democrats have enough votes to use a tactic called a filibuster to thwart President Trump's Supreme Court nominee. Four more Senate Democrats said they would use the procedural roadblock on the nomination of Ney Gorsuch, giving the party the 41 votes they need. Republicans may then resort to the so-called nuclear option, changing the rules to ram through their nominee. The nomination went through committee on Monday. The stage is now set for a showdown on Friday when it goes to the full Senate. The standoff could leave Congress even more plagued by better gridlock. Many Democrats say Mr. Gorsuch has shown he is too prone to favoring corporations to earn their support. Republicans control the Senate chamber by 52 to 48, but need 60 votes to overcome a Democratic filibuster. That will be for international news. Now, the Shaman Municipal Assembly is contemplating shutting down a dump site whose hazardous fumes are said to be impacting negatively on the health of pupils in a nearby school. The fumes emanating from the dump site, which is perpetually burning, engulfs the Shaman Presby School, compelling the authorities to send the pupils away in some instances when the pollution becomes too much to bear. As the Assembly works on a permanent solution, it says some medium-term interventions have been put in place to minimize the harmful effects of the hazardous smoke. Join us is Mapitsu Sabidi has more. Thick smoke bellowing into the sky as the refuse dump is set alight during the day when school children are having lessons. The situation has been going on for four months now. When Joy News visited the area a week ago, the smoke from the refuse dump was so intense, some classes had been dismissed and others moved far away somewhere under a tree. Teachers and pupils of Ashaim and Presby School were very unhappy about the situation, which they say disrupts teaching and learning. We already know that a smoke is not good for the body. And then um, as students, we, have, uh, we are all people. We have asthmatic patients. As I'm speaking with you right now, we have one asthmatic child in Form 1. A. So the other time when the smoke was being severe, he fainted and then when he was taken to the hospital, there was like there were stinks of uh, smoke in his lungs. Mm -hmm. Now you know, um, smokers are the, those who are suffering from that problem. Mm -hmm. And then, then the doctor was curious that, okay, is the, is the child smoking at this age? And then, see, it is from the smoke. When it enters the body, it's really, it, like, it is clean us inside. The Ashaiman Municipal Assembly, however, says the fire service is managing the situation in the morning to allow school children and residents to go about their daily activities. Zoom Lion is actually in charge of the place. So when they bring, they cut them to the final refuse point at Lafayette the site at Boom. The, the program, you know, got out of hand and uh, we, that, that's why I indicated there's a solution. We, uh, you see, if one is refuse, there are a whole lot of things, you know, combustibles. So when they dumped, and because the rain delayed in raining, the thing had been there for almost a month or two, and the fire sparks. Apart from that, those who collect receptacles also cannot be ruled out that they are also part of setting fire into the place. So we, we tried to, you know, fire service has been trying to water the place every morning, try to bring the, the smoke down. As we indicated in the morning, for instance, the direction of the wind changes to the bottle way. But by midday or in the afternoon, the direction also changes to this direction. It's affecting school, teaching and learning, 
and it's also affecting the community as well. Joshua Adams Asine says, a complete shutdown of the dump sites is one of the permanent solutions under consideration. In the interim measure we've done to increase the fare a bit so that it will deter them from coming. Apart from that, Zoom Lion has also placed a, com a compactor, a vehicle there and all the truck pushers. That's why we've seen them line up over there. They no, no more dump at the reference dump. So they, 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 they deposit them they, they, into the compactor, and the compactor conveys them to the landfill site. So they are waiting. The vehicles that you see over there, they are not going to the landfill site. They are waiting for the Zoom Lion compactor to convey them. But we're also directed that all those si tricycles who can drive to the landfill site, they are no more coming here. We are, we are restricting them from bringing, so only the, the, the trucks. So all the, 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 the tricycles are now sending their refuse straight to the landfill size. With these measures that we've put in place, it's actually reducing the pressure over the, the refuse generation. But the eventual, as indicated, the last result is to evacuate. For now, the school children and teachers would have to endure the inconvenience until a permanent solution is put in place. The chief of Kohue TV, Barima Kwame Asante Tiani II, warns this year's paragliding festival at Kwehu cancelled for safety reasons. He believes, though, a major feature in the festivities, calling off the paragliding sessions for this year alone should not disrupt it. Barima Kwame Asante Tiani cites the deplorable nature of the road leading to Ujia Noma Mountains as one of the reasons why he's against the event and that some safety measures should be instituted first to avert any disaster should governments insist on going ahead with it. Correspondent Maxwell Kudakos report. We are left with just about 11 or 12 days to the main event, that is the Kwao Paragliding Festival. Uh, we've come here to have a look at the preparation so far by authorities or managers of the paragliding site, and then also assess the nature of the road and safety measures that have been put in place here. Uh, driving right away from Etibia to Ibianuma, one can see for him or herself that there's a very poor road network that connects Etibia to Ibianuma. The road seems to be a one-way road that two cars can now ply at the same time unless authorities expand the road. You could see that there are a lot of trees that, are, that have grown on rocks and most of the roots of these trees have been exposed to the bare sun and to the mercy of the weather that if there is a heavy wind blow around here, the, the, the roots may be uprooted. From Atibia right down to the Paragrade side, uh, the road has become a dead devilish uh, uh, feature, which I think it will be possible for government to forget this year's uh, Paragrade participation. And I think it will rather help us and we, we will avoid any disaster like the Kintampo uh, situation. Things are in a very horrible uh, way. I've been from the first camp, if only I've been there before, and I think this is your first time of uh, visiting the Paragliding site. From the first camp to the Paragliding site, there are uh, so many gullies. Even if somebody enters into the uh, gully, uh, from the knee to the uh, the upper part of your body is what you see. But the lower part, is, uh, uh, it has been engulfed. This year marks the 30th year of the paragliding anniversary, but very little has been done so far to keep the place very active. As we've been told in the past that the paragliding event at Go is going to be a biannual f uh, festival or an affair. One could say that management of the place or managing the place has been a very poor one. For Joy News, Maxwell Kudelko reporting. In other news, former Vice President Kutimi Saata has announced he plans to closely scrutinize the Kufado government once it has all its appointees in place. In his first ever interview since the NDC's defeat at the 2016 polls, the former Vice President said he has no plans of staying away from national affairs as he will be commenting on national issues as and when necessary. He was speaking exclusively to join us on the sidelines of the launch of the first African Study Bible here in Accra. 
I'm, I'm going to be active. I will comment on national affairs as I see fit. I have a lot of experience in many things, and I'm not going to be sitting in a corner when things are going wrong. If things are going wrong, I'll speak about them. If things are going right, I'll comment whoever is doing the right thing, but I'll comment on national affairs. How about the arena of politics? We are supposed to see you on the ticket of the NDC. Whatever the calling is... No, sorry, what, what was your question? In terms of the arena of politics, are we expecting to see you on the ticket of a party? I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be active in national life, in all aspects of national life. And so that's, that's, that's my... Just opinion. to be clear, whether this is the, you are done with active politics or you still stay in it. Can one be ever, in this after um, having occupied this position, ignore things that happen. I'm saying that you cannot ignore things that happen in our country. And we, the people who have been privileged to serve, should be able to draw many lessons from what, what goes on so that we can help to improve conditions of life for the people. So you continue to be available and put yourself up? To be active, I'll continue to comment. I'll, we have given, the government has um, just come into office. Um, I think we must allow the president time to settle in office to to appoint the people to help himself but as soon as that is done and they start administering our country we will be able to then take them to task for things that are not going right and things and then and commend them also for things that they do right but so far have you been I, I reserve my comments. Uh, it, they're not 100 days yet. It's been about four months. They have some few they days, less than 20 days. Uh, they haven't done 100 days yet. I reserve all comments until they have passed through their standard 100 days, and then we shall we start commenting. Now, technology has largely been dominated by men, with most women simply shying away, having bought into the stereotype. There are some women who have increasingly defined the odds and taking up roles in that field. About 118 of them Monday graduated in various fields of engineering from the Pensacola School Complex in Accra. Tano Dame was there, was with them for joining us. The students have been taken through two years of training to build technologies in various fields. They shared with me how they overcame their fears and ventured into what has until now been a male-dominated field. This one is ratification. Okay. This one, we are changing AC to DC. If you use the Zener diode, it will, change, it will take all the ACs from it. So when you are listening to a radio, you will not hear that sound that you don't, you don't want. Okay. When you are going to some offices, when you want to enter, they will write something like Aquaba or Welcome. Yes. They use this thing to write it. Okay, what is it called? This one is a stable multivibrator. Stable. Now, you know the, the myth about women in electronics. Yes. Why did you decide to join in particular? Okay, I like electronics because if I see females in males field, I really like it. So the first day you came to the school and you saw all these gadgets and samples, did it scare you? Did it tell yes, you, well, because, I don't want to do it anymore? Oh, I was scared because some of the names I, did, I have not even heard some before, but our teacher motivated us that if you said you can do it, you can do it. So we felt happy and now I can do every time. This is an amplifier. And here is the volume control. If I want it to be high, I just raise it. And if I want it to be low, I'll just turn it. Now you talked about you not being comfortable when you were coming here. Uh, what were some of the difficulties you had running through your mind? Like after school, I didn't plan to, I didn't even plan of this course. And when I first came, I was not fully interested in it. So I was not taking all things that easy. But when I came in, I then, like things have started, I feel like I feel easy to do everything. I can build my own power supply in those kind of stuff. As an open day in the school, First Lady Rebecca Ekufuadu admonished the students to use the knowledge gained to make history in electronics in Ghana. You ladies give me so much hope for the future. You have set out an exciting journey to positively affect our world. The Ghanaian government is committed to solving the challenge of unemployment and increasing the avenues for female employment and economic well-being. Dear girls from various junior high schools gathered here, I entreat you to take the opportunity presented to you today. 
ask all the questions to understand the project and take a decision to be part of the girls making history in the electronic sector in Ghana and the world at large. The training was sponsored by the Korean and Germany embassies. For Joy News, my name is Hannah Odami. Up next, we bring you entertainment.